ti panda
Thank you very much. Um, Ibo. Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my task is really to outline what these elections in Zambia uh, mean and to discuss the context in which these elections took place. And I'll start by, first of all, um, uh, making reference to the fact that uh, uh, the elections were peaceful, uh, by and large, of course, there were a few cases of violence, uh, but on the whole, people turned up in large numbers. Most woke up very early in the morning, and we saw that um, uh, most of those on the queues were young people. Uh, so this election appears to have been decided by the, the young people of Zambia. Um, and of course, the question is um, why they had to do that, why they had to turn up in such large numbers uh, to come and vote. And one is, can, can actually say that uh, the economy has been uh, only free for. Uh, we have as a country now, uh, our debt is in excess of $12 uh, billion. Dollars. And uh, uh, this itself is unsustainable. Uh, only last year, Zambia was unable to service uh, a, a $2 million uh, loan to the uh, Eurobond uh, creditors. Uh, that itself was the signal that there is something very wrong. But by and large, um, this election has been won by the opposition and it was unexpected. It was unexpected because uh, the playing field was uneven, it was unfair, and uh, many people feared that there will be a repeat of 2016. Um, the opposition was not allowed to campaign freely. Uh, in many places, the opposition leader who is now president-elect was prevented from flying to particular parts of the country, uh, while his competitor, the, the, the president, was flying everywhere. Uh, he was prevented from uh, flying to uh, the Copper Belt. Uh, he was denied um, flying permits to the eastern province. Uh, and in Nakonde, his uh, motorcade, or his, you know, when he tra tra traveled there by road, the police prevented him from entering the city. So that was some of the few instances, but there are quite many. I mean, the, the, this, this is what I can talk about on this forum, but there are many of them around. But also, I think between 2016 and, the, and this, this year, uh, we also saw that the, the opposition was harassed in many places. Uh, the opposition was not allowed to campaign in many places. Uh, in Osaka, for example, there were rarely any rallies. In fact, it was difficult to know the support that the opposition had on the ground. Uh, so was the Copper Belt. The opposition was simply not allowed to campaign there. So we were going to the election in, in that environment of unfreeness and, the, and of course, uh, um, unfairness. Uh, but apart from that, the media was also you know, restricted. Some of the media houses were closed for the post ministry, but notably, and also um, uh, movie, they're not movie TV, but uh, prime TV. Uh, some others like movie TV were were suspended, uh, uh, suspended or they were uh, given warnings. Uh, there are many cases where uh, whenever opposition leaders were on, um, on, a, on a radio, on a station, they would, you know, the party cutters would do, turn up there and of course uh, make sure that the station is closes and the person who is talking is removed. Um, but let me ask, let me try to ask and uh, ask and answer, I think, a broad question that everyone is asking. And this is what does this election result mean? Um, the Electoral Commission of Zambia announced in the early hours of uh, yesterday uh, that uh, Mr. Hakanda Chirema had won the election. Uh, and had polled 
752, uh, 357 votes, followed by uh, Mr. Eddie Kalungu, who polled 1,814,201 votes, a total of uh, 4,800,000 plus uh, Zambians cast their votes. And uh, uh, Mr. Ichirema poured 59% of that, uh, of all the valid votes cast, followed by uh, Mr. Lungu, who poured 38% of the votes cast. Wow. The scale of the, of the win by UPND is massive. It can be called a landslide. And the defeat of the Patriotic Front is also very huge. It was unexpected and the scale is really devastating. What does this really mean? Many people are asking the question, how has this happened? And I venture to offer a few explanations. They may not be exhaustive. The first one has to do with uh, internal factionalism within the patriotic front. Within the patriotic front, there was already a developing uh, factionalism where the party was being taken over by people who came from the MMD. So there was a perception that the party was being taken over by outsiders. That itself created discontent within the patriotic front. The second factor has to do with the decision by uh, President Lungu to contest a third term. That was an unpopular decision within the patriotic front itself, and many people within the patriotic front did not actually support him going for a third term. That itself has created a, 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 a faction that was were opposed to him. Thirdly, was the fact that he chose a running mate who was unpopular in the party. This is Professor Kanduluo. That itself is a third factor that created internal decision within the patriotic front. So within the patriotic front and within the, the, the strong patriotic front, Eastern province, Muchinga, uh, Copper Belt, Lusaka, uh, uh, Luapula, and Northern Province, we have a lot of PF members who were dissatisfied with the manner in which uh, the party was being run, with the manner in which uh, you know, the, the running mate was chosen. That itself partly explains why there was this sea change, this uh, rebellion, so to speak, by people within the Patriot Front. Uh, secondly, is the economy. Uh, the economy has been very bad, you know, and people have lost their job. There's high you know, unemployment among the youth uh, and in the urban areas. And that this also has been a very strong factor, especially for young people. And part of the reason is that uh, uh, resources were being distributed on partisan lines. Uh, we have heard about empowerment funds and all these things. These empowerment funds were not been given to everybody. They only been given to those people who were affiliated to the patriotic front. That itself raised some, a lot of anger in people. But of course, the cost of living itself is high, and many people in urban areas having difficulty to make ends meet. Uh, many people in urban areas are seeing the prices of commodities rose so high uh, within this period. Thirdly, I think, is the factor of impunity, uh, the, the, the growing impunity uh, is, has been a concern, the growing corruption has been a concern, and of course, the use of patronage in a manner that shows that you can only get somewhere, you can only get something if you belong to the ruling party. There was also, and I, I think my colleagues will come and talk about this and amplify on it, uh, the issue of cadreism, where party cadres were really the people who were controlling the country and controlling the government. The police was not even able to maintain law and order because of cadres. This many people, especially urban, urban dwellers, found it very unacceptable. The markets, the bus stations were controlled 
by ruling party cadres. And that, that particular experience, I think, that, that pleases a lot of people. And let me conclude by uh, talking about rights. I think the, the last part I'd like to talk about is the fact that people's rights were eroded in the last seven or maybe 10 years, but last seven years have been worse. For example, it was difficult for people to speak. There was fear in the country. People were not able to express themselves uh, because otherwise they would be victimized. Uh, it was difficult to demonstrate. No one could demonstrate the police would come and crush you. This is despite the fact that the constitution allows Zambians to protest, that it allows Zambians to uh, assemble, it allows Zambians to associate. But it was difficult to have any public meetings, not even for NGOs. Whenever a public meeting was held, and the especially a public meeting was to talk about government, it was anti-government discussion, it would be disrupted. Even a meeting in, in churches, meeting in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in hotels, the meetings would be disrupted by either not party cadres or by the police. So that, that culture, that experience of fear, uh, the fact that Newspapers were closed at will as long as they were seen to be uh, opposed to the regime, I think affected a lot of Zambians. And so these are some of the factors that created the situation where most of the people who voted were actually voting in protest against the patriotic front. So I would like to say and to conclude by saying what we had on Thursday was a referendum against the party and the third uh, Lungu said them be. People rose for that uh, don't, don't materialize. They are not, they can, they can not see another five years of the same thing. Let me stop there for now. Thank you. And uh, Neo, before you, you depart for the time being, yeah. Yeah, can you tell us uh, more about the challenges ahead? Uh, for the new government, especially on the economic front. Any the challenges ahead, as, yes, the challenges ahead. Any, that, any, any indication as the policy framework uh, yes. uh, that informed the election pro, uh, pro program? Yes, the, the challenges ahead yeah. is to really fix what can be called a broken economy. Um, the, the huge uh, the huge um, uh, youth unemployment, I think it should be addressed. Uh, the, the huge debt uh, is actually agent. You know, the, we have to find the solution to tackling and dismantling the huge debt. Then there is a problem with the mines. Um, and I think that it should be really uh, uh, task number one for Mr. Uh, Ishilema when he starts his, his, on, his, in his, on his desk on Tuesday next week. The task number one is to deal with the mines. Uh, what the Patriotic Fund government has done is really to try to nationalize uh, the Mopani and the, and the KCM, but in a manner that does not really uh, bring anything on the table. There's not, there's not, no benefit that we've got from that, those decisions. Uh, because the companies were suffering, they were, they, they were, they were not uh, performing well, and instead of allowing new investment into these companies, uh, instead of allowing them to restructure themselves, the, 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 the government simply played to the gallery by saying, don't close, we'll, we'll help you. And then use government money to bail them out. And, and, and we are not, don't have the money to do that. The decision to nationalize, to privatize the mines was made because the Zambian government was unable to run them. What we thought would happen is that we would come up with a tax regime where the nation would benefit. They would run professionally, they would run commercially by, by investor, international investors, and we would get a higher return from them. What we were supposed to be talking about are taxes. How do we tax the mines in a way that is beneficial to the Zambian people? The mines are in a mess, and I think that is the area where we... And they are in a mess at the time when the, the, the price is very high. So I think that is another area that we we need to, to, look, to look at. But there are many other areas. I think the, the dis displacement, for example, of the empowerment funds, the displacement of the, uh, the, the, of the, of the social cash transfer, the displacement of uh, uh, the, the, the FISIP funds, 
was done in a very you know patronizing and of course it followed you know uh, it followed ways that it, it went it, it was used in a way to actually campaign and not decide to empower people so there is money there that could be used uh, in a way that is more equitable but it was not you know they, they all my all manner of distribution of money only to people who were actually connected to the, to the regime so those are some of the things that I think could be done. The, the, the most important thing is to ensure that the economy is in, in stronger footing. Uh, and we have the resources all right, but these resources have not been properly allocated. And the corruption, I think it stands uh, on top of most of these things. And, and I hope that systems will be put in place uh, to ensure that uh, people don't benefit you know, from public resources. Uh, that, those are some of the things I can talk about as, as the immediate ones, but of course, Yesterday, we heard from uh, incoming President Hichilema saying that he's going to ensure that the Kazarism culture is going to go, but you know, the, 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 the markets and bus stations will no longer be run by Kadars. That is, a, at least, it is a good signal, and we hope that uh, that will be carried through. No, thanks, thanks, Neil. I think you've given us some of the dynamics that have informed the election outcome. It's a very interesting uh, outline that you've given us. Now, Colin Owen, uh, to reflect on what Neo has said so far, but also to attend to the, the issues that we put at the, at, the, at the very outset, namely the, in particular, the, turn, the turnaround strategy and whether, uh, given the immense influence, the, the world, first of all, the, the economic challenges, whether this means uh, Zambia is going back to the traditional route, uh, back to the IMF and World Bank, back to neoliberal economics, or whether it's going to be a mixture of both, in, uh, including uh, uh, a resort to, to state enterprises again as engines of economic development, uh, to address the, the unemployment challenge. You know, I'll leave that to you, Owen. Owen, uh, Tony. Thank you. Thank you, Ibo. Uh, first of all, let me agree with uh, Neo on a, a number of uh, issues uh, uh, pertaining to the landslide victory of uh, UPND. The factions in uh, the Patriotic Front, especially the rise of the MMD and one might add Eastern Province uh, members of parliament into the Central Committee uh, annoyed uh, other m factions in the party for two reasons. The first one is that they were outsiders and that they were very hostile to, to the Patriotic Front when they were in, uh, in office. Uh, but uh, beyond that, they strongly fought against uh, uh, the rise into the presidency of uh, uh, Edgar Lungu himself. So the faction that had uh, supported the rise of Lungu in 2015, when the Lungu presidency was actually dead in the water. Uh, the forces pitted against it were very strong. The newspapers at that time were referring to the cartel. And this cartel, in my view, has not uh, uh, been uh, analyzed in detail, but it has, um, for want of a better word, pro-business, uh, pro-business rather than pro-region or pro-personal uh, agendas. And so uh, it was a double betrayal for those who had uh, fought very hard to put uh, Ed, Ed Galungu into office to see him then uh, promote the, the ones who had been opposing him. Maybe he, his, uh, his plan was to bring them over to his side, and clearly it hasn't uh, worked. The third term 
always annoys uh, Zambians, and uh, there was a, a heated uh, battle to prevent uh, him from assuming office, but uh, rather from even running as a as a candidate for the party. But unlike Owen, who lost, who lost you, Owen? 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 Uh, yeah, I can't Owen. hear you. Owen? Owen? Yes, Owen. Owen? Laura, be better on standby, Laura. Maybe we'll come back to Owen later. Owen. Unfortunately, he seems to have left the meeting. Okay, Laura. I call Laura meeting. Laura. Laura there. Laura. Uh, Laura. Sorry, Ibo. My, my line is a bit unstable. Okay, carry on then. Yeah, I'll try and uh, rush through. Uh, okay. The, the, the millennials have uh, networks. They are very well connected. They discuss issues uh, continuously. And they are particularly hostile to Kanduluo for not being supportive when she was Minister of Higher Education. And uh, they are also very attracted to the promise uh, made by... by um, H2O, they had a, a, a motivation to get rid of an enemy on one side and to gain the benefits of a free education, which many have realized is the true empowerment and not the handouts of cash that uh, the outgoing uh, government was uh, known for. Now, uh, if we look at the national situation, yes, uh, uh, Neo has spelled it out quite accurately, but it's very uneven. The Problems on the copper belt do affect the, the rest of the country, but they are quite different from the problems in Osaka. And even in the problems in the new copper belt in, in Northwestern province, which uh, generally performs better than the old copper belt. Uh, the Eastern province had a, a very successful agricultural season there was money circulating in the villages. They were buying motorbikes and bicycles and said for change. So clearly the moment, similar to 1991, rather than to the regime change of uh, uh, 2011. I think 2011 was quite different from the others. Uh, I can't go into the details uh, now, but uh, suffice it to say that uh, 2011 uh, polls gave us a three-party parliament and not a, a one-party dominant parliament like we had in 1991 and as we have now. Uh, in the... challenges ahead, I think the, the most uh, important one, which uh, the other parties are not taking into uh, account, is that neoliberalism has run its course. It cannot make the promises that it made in the good governance days of 1990s. It has failed to create employment globally it has failed to create wealth. The only country that has uh, grown significantly is China. 
And so, although it was not mentioned even by the Socialist Party in any detail, I think we are going to face some serious ideological battles ahead. Uh, PF was trying to use state enterprise as a job creation uh, um, approach and also by implication and even directly linking um, HH personally and his party to privatization and uh, therefore the poverty that has uh, continued under uh, an economic system that uh, promotes tax evasion and actually looks at tax evasion as a valid business strategy. As far as the tax uh, uh, behaviors of the new mines led by First Quantum and the old mines where you have Glencoe and Vedanta as the, the key actors, they are not exactly the same. Suffice it to say that uh, uh, it's been very painful to see Zambia failing to benefit from the sustained high uh, copper prices. And uh, the government has intervened at times with statutory instruments to try and correct this, but they have always uh, back trading. So um, it's possible that this is linked to the corruption that. Uh, um, and Neo Simtani mentioned. Let me end by looking at uh, the way forward. I think the way forward must include a stronger regional cooperation. There is currently a lot of competition between uh, Tanzanian truckers delivering inland from the port of Dar es Salaam. Mozambique has also joined that game. Uh, Zimbabwe has a very huge um, number of trucks on the roads, uh, servicing its own and also the, the, the needs of uh, inland countries like uh, DRC. And uh, uh, from the Zambian side, there is a huge market in the Congo for Zambian agricultural products, which hasn't uh, been fully uh, taken advantage of. And it's even discouraged by the government at cross-border trade as a unprofitable venture, that uh, it's uh, smuggling rather than trade. But if there's no trans-Southern Africa railway system functioning, the roads have already, at least in Zambia, the roads have reached breaking point. They cannot handle that number of overloaded tracks. And of course, when the roads uh, break down, it affects every other transporter, uh, including internal trade, uh, cross-border trade, and the, the daily market gardening uh, that um, feeds the cities. Uh, so, although the uh, UPND victory is uh, very convincing, they were very focused on regime change. Uh, of course, regime change in small letters, not uh, any change in the system, just a change in the personality. And they will be confronted with the reality that the cadres at the market are active in those uh, spheres of our lives because they don't have jobs. And it doesn't matter who the president is, they, they are going to be challenged. Uh, it's very profitable to collect uh, rent from uh, bus passengers and much more difficult to turn a, a one acre gift of land from the government into a profitable activity. Uh, so there's going to be confrontation between the youth who have now become used to surviving outside the formal economy and uh, making money from bus stations, uh, from markets and so on. And uh, the government that uh, sees itself as uh, efficient um, 
experienced in, in, in running businesses. And I think uh, as successful as they may be, they have no clue how the informal economy works. Most of uh, the issues that uh, I might uh, raise were reported in the uh, final report of the Commission of Inquiry into voting patterns and uh, political violence of which I was a member. I don't think the PF paid much attention to uh, the issues that were raised there. And uh, in part, they've paid the, the, the price because of not taking that into account. Finally, let me say, whenever we have regime change in, uh, in Zambia, there's been a slight opening up in uh, the right to assemble and the right to debate issues. And of course, from Lusaka, it doesn't seem like that, but in the rural areas, now that almost every district has got uh, one or more community radio stations, there's been quite robust discussion of uh, local issues. And so uh, the election, especially for MPs and councillors, uh, was more about local issues than uh, the national issues that brought about uh, the new uh, president. So I think for now, let me end there and we can elaborate later if there's time. Thank you. Yes, thanks, thanks, thanks Owen. I'd, I'd like mm -hmm. to hear more later on, mm -hmm. on that commission of inquiry in which you served and, and, and the extent to which, uh, as you said, uh, the PF has paid a price by ignoring the, the recommendation of the, of the Commission of Inquiry. And um, so we'll come back to you on that. Uh, but you have, you have touched on the regional cooperation issue and I hope that uh, uh, Zamchia will take up that um, when he comes in on the lessons of the region. But now, um, Laura, Eva, Miti, can you come in now, please? You can reflect on some of the, the three themes which we're pursuing. One, the explain the outcome of the elections. Uh, two, what does it say of the national situation? And thirdly, the challenges ahead. Is Miti there? Miti? Neo, is Mitty there? No, I've not seen her. There was someone called Eva. Um, Eva. Uh, it was Eva. Mitty. You know, it's a different person. And Joseph Mwenda, I don't see him at all. Is he there? Mwenda? Neo? Neo? Is Mwenda in? Okay, I'll go to McDonald's, McDonald's, Spenzi. McDonald's, can you come in, please? McDonald's? McDonald's? I'm here. Yes? I'm here. That McDonald's? I'm here, I'm here. Okay, carry on. Hello. Thank yes. you. Okay. Um, yes, uh, thank you so much. Um, I speak from um, Dia's point of view. Can you switch the picture? McDonald. McDonald. Brent McDonald. Hello. Yes, carry on, please. Thank you. Um, indeed, the third term um, issue uh, was big, uh, not only in the PF, but also outside the PF, among the citizens. I think this election has defined 
are the the role of citizens in stopping constitutional manipulation by sitting presidents or regimes using institutions that they may have captured or indeed have control over. Uh, so the third term issue uh, was eating both the inside of the PF and also the outside of the PF. A number of people, a number of senior officials within the PF didn't want this person to go for a third election consecutively. And the people themselves felt food to have somebody insisting to go for a third term or a third election when all along after the Kaunda era, they didn't want a president who stays in perpetuity. So this was a big issue. And this indeed had an impact on this election, both from outside and within. The other thing was that people were discontent with the work of the judiciary and other institutions of governance, the police, um, the anti-corruption, uh, the electoral commission of Zambia itself, um, the Drug Enforcement Commission, and especially this year, uh, the Financial Intelligence Center. I think people felt that this regime had gone too far in undermining the authority and the powers of these institutions. And they thought it is better to start afresh and ensure that the police maintain law and order, not because this person who has broken the law belongs to this party or that party. So that also uh, pushed or ignited a zeal or ignited the zeal within the citizens to decide to change uh, the regime. The issue of division within the Patriotic Front also caused the change that we saw uh, on, the, on the 16th uh, of, um, uh, of August. A number of people felt cheated at the convention of the PF. The convention of the PF Hello, am I there? Yes, you're still connected. Yes. You're connected, we can hear you. Yeah, unfortunately, the power has gone. But we can hear you, can on talk? So I'll disconnect my picture. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so um, a number of people felt that the convention was a sham and they were not given the right to choose leaders. And the president chose leaders on his own by subjecting a list to the to the to the the, to the so-called convention delegate. There was nothing that was happening uh, at the convention. So people within the PF felt shortchanged. They felt shortchanged at the convention. So they, that, that, that faction that had formed outside the convention, uh, the convention vindicated them that the man was not tolerant, one, to divergent views, and two, wanted to continue to stay in power even when uh, the Zambian, the, 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 the party members wanted to remove certain individuals from the party. I think it's the only party that went to the convention the biggest part that went to the convention where no ballot was uh, cast and that annoyed the number of people. It annoyed the number of people. The other thing I think under factionalism is of course, which Doc Mutani mentioned, the, 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 the appointment uh, of um, um, 
that first, before I go to what uh, 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 Dr. Simtani talked about, is also after the convention, the president failed to appoint uh, office holders within the PF. It is the first time that the PF has gone to the to 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 the to the, to, to, the, to, to a major election without a, a vice president, without a chairman for elections, without other portfolio holders, except for the the chairman, uh, the party chairman, the president, and the secretary general. The rest of them were just MCCs. That also had an impact in the campaign because people were not motivated uh, to, uh, to campaign when they were not members. And they, then they came the, uh, the acceptance of those people who used to insult the, the party into the far and ranks of the party. And they were even given uh, uh, positions of influence within the party. And this, we can talk about the GBMs of this world, the Shimba Kambwiri, the Charles Kakomas, who is from the same day of defecting uh, is appointed as member of the Central Committee. That created or indeed um, made sure that uh, this factionalism was, was getting bigger and bigger and, or, or enlarged. Uh, then it came to the issue of uh, uh, going wherever, uh, you know, trying to go and, um, and especially that you had people who had interest to contest who were also bad and they went to the other side uh, of the coin. That is, they supported the opposition. So that in itself uh, really uh, 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 pushed the factionalism aspect of um, the PF uh, even, even more prominent in this election. The issue of youth unemployment. That is a very, uh, that is actually the biggest cause of the youth turnout. The, the youth unemployment and the, the raise and emergence sustenance of capitalism. These caused a lot of problems within the PF and among the people who felt they had, the <coughs> youth unemployment was getting out of hand. Even the educated ones, could not find employment. The dropout was even worse. They were not even considered. They became outcasts within their own country because there were no, uh, there, there was no industry, there were no industries, there were no opportunities for unskilled labor. That in itself caused the problems in the, in the country. So that is uh, what, uh, that, what, what, what would say on the issue of um, the issue of uh, uh, youth unemployment uh, and, and capitalism. So this capitalism uh, that emerged sustained the system. It sustained the system because the money that they were collecting was actually used for party, mostly for party functions, and also was used to help, you know, uh, to, 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 to help um, uh, grow or indeed recruit some people who are calling themselves commanders and so, or, or all kinds of things who were also party sympathizers, party partisans who would even go to the president at any time and so on and so forth. They became so big. The issue that I, I mentioned about the Qatarism. So the Qatarism actually annoyed the people so much because no one would freely move on the road, at the markets, at bus stations, uh, 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 the ranks, even in the, in the public, uh, public institutions, the cadres were all over. They could even call. Uh, McDonald's. McDonald. McDonald. 
We'll come back to you, McDonald. Let me just go back. Uh, let me go a, back to a, a, a PS, a director. What they would close. Yeah, in front of the president, the president had no control uh, of individuals, including the police, violating people's rights. Okay? You can talk about the abuse of the public order act, the abuse of the uh, COVID-19 guideline on citizens. That annoyed people a lot. People could not assemble. People could not uh, freely express. The media was being harassed. When they, they, when they, 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 they feature a, an opposition leader, the media McDonald, will be... McDonald, 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 can you wind up? Can you wind up? Yes. Wind up. So also the role of the social media was um, played a bigger role in this thing. The preaching about tribalism and regionalism annoyed a lot of people. So the, 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 the election itself well, had all these factors that caused about the way forward. We need to liberate the media. We need to open the civic and political space so that people can freely express, associate, move, and assemble. We need to review laws that are inimical to the democratic growth and consolidation in our country. We also need to restructure our institutions, especially the appointment modalities, if we are to move. And above all, we need to find solutions to the dropout from grade seven up to 12. Those dropouts, we need to first revisit why Zambia National Service was, was created, is, is to take up this unskilled labor. So we need this unskilled labor to be, to, 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 to have opportunities to do so that they end. Doing that will reduce the capitalism, will also reduce the junks that have emerged in our society. Thank you, I submit. Thanks, uh, McDonald. We'll come back to you during discussion time. I'd like to go back, to, before I call on uh, Pilani Zamshi, I'll go back to, to Simutani. Owen raised, and, and so has McDonald, the, the uh, specter of unemployment, youth unemployment. Uh, which factor, especially the youth, was a, 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 a very key factor in the election. How will the new government attend to this problem? It's a problem, as we've seen in discussions on Zimbabwe or South Africa, is the elephant in the room the proverbial elephant in the room. How will the new government do that simultaneously? Any yes, indication uh, in, in the yeah. program, in the policy, policy document, what does the policy document say with respect to these matters? Because I, I, I don't think that we want to confine the discussion merely to, the, to what Owen called regime change, the, the, the kind of uh, mild regime change, not, not the harsh, all elections are about regime change, I think. Yes. But I think this circulation of elites, uh, uh, governments come in and we find this, they're confronted with the same problems. You can we expect something innovative from the new government, something new, something out of the ordinary. Yes, so um, yes, indeed. Um, I, 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 in fact, wanted to comment on uh, uh, what Owen uh, uh, referred to uh, the difficulty of uh, getting rid of cadreism and the fact that um, uh, these youths in um, markets and bus stations get actually employed. What they do, the collection of levies and so forth, is a form of employment. Uh, the fact that they uh, tax people, you know, to all the people are market. That's how they end their income. Um, uh, President Michael Slack tried to deal with that by chasing the this from the streets, and it didn't work because the reason what there was nothing else in his place. So the UPND is talking about forming cooperatives, and that use these young people would then have 
some empowerment funds to do something for themselves. Uh, I think that is workable. You know, if, they, if there were some forms of way of organizing them into economic activities, what the problem has been that they are not organized and that they are, they are, they, they are not actually, they don't, they're not respectful of the rule of law. Whatever they do is normally against all the known norms about business. Uh, and this is what is worrying, you know, the fact that, uh, you know, these youth, these cadres harass people, they harass people. And, you know, you can only survive, you can only, those who are at markets have to actually affiliate uh, to the ruling party to be able to trade. These are the things that can be dealt with. It is possible that these people can be, can be organized. And I think the, the European Union is talking about organizing these people, finding them out alternative forms of income generation. That can be done. The money is, has been used, you know, the, the, the outgoing government has, has thrown around money uh, in, in the name of empowerment. But this money that has been thrown has only been received or benefited by people who are connected to the, to the ruling party. That's what annoys, annoys people. But I think it is possible to actually do this in an organized way. It's, they, 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 there is a way of doing this. Uh, and we're talking about uh, the, the, the kind of uh, economy that uh, um, uh, UPND is going to run, whether it will depart from what is there. Uh, again, I think it's really, um, I don't think that it will be very different from what we have. Uh, there may be a bit of order, a bit of uh, respect for rules, uh, but the thing is that uh, it may, we may not have it, we may not see a transformation. That's not likely to happen. Uh, but what is likely to happen is uh, that the mines may be better organized, they may be better run, and that will allow them to, to employ more people. Because as it is now, they're not properly run. Uh, and, and the government interference, I think, is choking them from actually performing the way they should. Uh, Monawasa tried to do that. And they began to perform. They were actually performing, and the, the, the state was earning much more money uh, through tax, just through the tax system. But of course, uh, um, the, Mr. Michael Sutter tried to in, in, in introduce uh, a tax regime that was actually not beneficial uh, to the mines and so forth. So, so this thing can be talked about. What I think uh, the way forward is that uh, the European leadership and the, the presidency of Akainde. Ichirema, should listen to citizens. They should involve them. They should be consultative. Um, I think if they are more consultative, if they involve more people in, 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 to bring new ideas on the table, they are likely to perform better than, than their previous regime. The previous government or the, the outgoing government didn't listen to advice. They, they, they were unilateral in the way they made decisions. And that cost them a lot. And I think it's possible early on to begin to work with different stakeholders and this economy can actually really improve. And I, and I think the opportunity is there. And they, and they, they have the, uh, the advantage of a, a, a huge electoral mandate. So the, the earlier they begin to do this, the better. All these issues about whether they, you know, they should continue and so forth, I think they will be, they will be addressed if they are consultative and they are able to listen uh, to, to Okay, yeah. thanks, thank Neil. And Owen, is it possible to get back, uh, Owen Sichone, is it possible to get back, or rather, what would, what would it take to get back at least to the Manawasa era? Owen? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, that's a tough one. The, the foundation of the economy is a liberalized one. It's a liberalized order. It doesn't sit well with cooperatives. It, it even doesn't sit well with uh, uh, a tax regime that we might call balanced. It uh, puts faith in corporate social responsibility. First, the companies must make the profit, then they will support the government in helping look after the poor. And this clashes with what happens in the informal sector. For example, when a, a market gardener arrives at the market with a, a truckload of tomatoes and surrenders the whole truckload to these young men at the, at the 
uh, market who decide the price and uh, do the selling and then hand over money to the owner, you might think that that's a very unfair system. But the farmers actually see it as a, a better, uh, less risky arrangement than trying to sell the whole truckload yourself and uh, perishables will be lost in the process. So unless you work at the market, you can't understand the logic behind these informal uh, contracts that they enter into. Uh, cooperatives are, are mentioned as a, as a very good system of pooling resources and uh, empowering uh, people to uh, acquire uh, better equipment, better marketing strategies and so on. There was a time when cooperatives in Zambia were thriving, uh, just on the, uh, in the run up to the collapse of the, of the one party regime. And they, when they were disbanded, they lost everything. So we are, we are still in a, a reconstructing uh, phase. And uh, ideologically, I think uh, the, the idea of a free market, freedom to, to trade uh, across borders and so on, that is more attractive than the government saying, we will organize for you. I think small scale traders are probably the best uh, business people in our economic system and a little bit more freedom, especially in a crisis uh, situation like this one would be more empowering than bureaucrats taking over and saying, this is uh, what we've given you in the budget and uh, this is the technology that we will provide you and so on. So we haven't put much thought to it and that is the worry that uh, uh, the clash is bound to come sooner, maybe, than later. Yeah. And thanks, Owen. Now, let me move to our last speaker. This is uh, Pilan Zamshe uh, to digest everything for us and more to draw some lessons for the SADC region and beyond, not only with respect to elections, electoral practices, but also with respect to the kind of challenges that confront uh, any new government, many of which are unemployment, the youth uh, bulge, and indeed just industrialization. These are challenges. Pilan is chair. Thank you very much, uh, convener. I had uh, politely asked you to allow me to share my screen. And uh, good evening, participants and all the viewers online. Uh, I'm trying to get the convener allow me to share my screen. Sure, you are free. Freedom of sharing. <laughs> yes, so don't you need to make me a co-host so we can share? <laughs> no, 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 don't worry about that. You can share your screen. Okay. These pro these professors and their screens. <laughs> Not everybody went to Oxford, you know, so don't uh, well, uh, don't uh, mesmerize. Uh, it's not about that. It's not but about your screens that, are very uh, uh, your screens are always very very informative. Oh, it seems it's not uh, it's it's not working at all. For today, so let's not waste uh, much time. Uh, let me just try to do without uh, uh, the screen. Yes. So, so I'm, I, it has really been fascinating uh, to listen to the Zambian experts talking about the current uh, election in Zambia which I actually think that uh, despite the problems associated with it, it's actually a proud moment for the young African democracy. And on that note, I'm just going to talk about six lessons from Zambia for the continent. 
management, uh, then we can always engage and debate. So I think the first fundamental lesson from Zambia is that uh, elections must not be political theater. You know, elections must not be spectacular political theater where they are used to legitimate the incumbent. And in line with political theater, I think we have seen some elections in Africa that continue to be characterized by procedural uncertainty and outcome certainty, even beyond the third term. For example, this year in 2021 alone, uh, if we look at the late president of Chad, he won the sixth term with 79% of the vote. In Jibot, the incumbent won the fifth term with an extravagant display of 97.3% of the vote. Yoweri Museweni, in power since 1986, had another political theater in Uganda. And in the Republic of Congo, the incumbent again won the fifth term with 88.4% of the votes. So Zambia reminds us that elections on the continent should allow for procedural certainty and outcome uncertainty. This means the rules of the game must be free and fair to allow any contestant to win and enable state power transfer. Lesson number two is that democracy needs strong institutions and not strong men. For what we learn from Zambia is that uh, as went the institutions, so went the transition. I'm glad that uh, Michael Bratton is, is in the room today. Um, he's the one who famously coined as when the military, so when the transition. So what enabled smooth transfer of power in Zambia was not just the goodwill of President Ed Galung, but robust independent institutions that support democracy. Even with Donald Trump, if it was not for strong institutions, the men could not could still be in power. So for emphasis, I think the professional conduct of the Zambian military institution and its non-involvement in civilian political processes has been a critical factor in ensuring peaceful transitions from one leadership to the other. This is unlike in other polities like Zimbabwe, where there is a symbiotic relationship between the army and the ruling party. Uh, ZANU-PF acting political commissar, Patrick Chinamasa, just recently restated that the Zimbabwe army has an inseparable bond with the ruling party. I quote, it speaks for itself who are the commanders of the army? Who is the CDF, Commander Defense Forces? Comrade Valerio Svanda. Who was he? He was a leading general in Zipra. Who is the commander of the National Army? Comrade Edzai Chimonyo. Who was he? He was a leading commander in Zanla. That culture of defending the sovereignty of this country will continue close court. So the army generals in Zimbabwe also confirm, for example, then army chief of staff, Major General Martin Chedondo summed this up uh, uh, when he said, we have signed and agreed to fight and protect the ruling party's principles of defending the revolution. If you have other thoughts, then you should remove that uniform. He was addressing uh, the army. So this kind of militarized politics is also consistent in Uganda and other polities. 
So a key lesson here is the need to invest in demilitarizing the politics. And where this has progressed to military coups, like in Zimbabwe and Mali, there's need to cure the coup first if electoral democracy is to work beyond holding regular uh, elections. And there are other institutions that fought back authoritarian resurgence in Zambia. This were the Electoral Commission of Zambia, despite the problems alluded to by, by Mr. Chipenzi, the heroic civil society in its diversity, the heroic independent media in its diversity, including community radio stations, and the Commonwealth and African Union observer missions. So institutions of this nature across SADC and beyond must be vibrant and independent if electoral democracy is to work. Uh, the so-called strong men have actually failed to deliver electoral democracy uh, in the region and beyond. If we look at the strong men of Equatorial Guinea, Ngeim Ambasago, he has served for 40 years and retained office with 93.7% of the vote in a sham election. The strong <laughs> men of Egypt, El Sisi, he has won a fast election with a dramatic 97.8% of the vote. The strong men of Cameroon, Paul Beer, in power for 38 years, 88 years old, got a new mandate in a discredited election in 2018. The strong men of Uganda, Museveni, seems allergic to electoral democracy. The strong men of Zimbabwe, Emerson Munangagwa, had to walk over dead bodies to state house after the army shot civilians in the streets during the 2018 presidential elections. He has no penchant for genuine democratic reforms. The list can be longer, but the point from Zambia is that democracy needs strong institutions and not strong men. I also hope that our friends in the diplomatic community who work with the strong men can really get this lesson from Zambia, which restates that democracy needs strong institutions and not strong men. And a practical take home is to invest in reforms of institutions that will even outlast the reformers. Then lesson number three, the personal element in diplomatic intervention is key. You know, swift diplomatic interventions using the personal element were important in enabling state power transfer in Zambia. Behind the scenes, Zambia's fourth president, Rupia Bwezani Banda, former Sierra Leone president, Ernest Bai Koroma, and former Tanzanian president, Jakaya Kikwete, quickly stepped in to facilitate a peaceful democratic transition. They were also remotely supported uh, by the British and the United Nations. So they did not wait for a former SADC team to take the lead once there was a Donald, uh, once there was a Donald Trump signal from President Lung and his team. So, so others who tried to block the transition behind the scenes, like Museveni, became isolated. So the lesson here is that uh, crisis-torn countries like Swaziland and Zimbabwe do not need to wait for the formal processes to kickstart mediation processes. If we look at how moribund uh, SADC is, they must find a Kikwete, a Banda, a Koroma, ETC, with the backing of the international community. Then election rigging has a ceiling. Election rigging has a ceiling. 
this was obviously not a perfectly free and fair election. It was heavily skewed in favor of the incumbent, as we have heard uh, from previous speakers, campaign restrictions, violence by the patriotic front cadres, manipulation of COVID-19 regulations, weaponization of the law, abuse of state media, lack of fundamental freedoms of expression, association, and assembly. Uh, but the lesson is that voter registration campaigns and high voter turnout can actually reduce rigging related to inflation and deflation of numbers. If, if the outcome is low, autocrats have a tendency to reverse the elections. If we still remember when Donald Trump was pressuring Georgia Secretary of State to recalculate the vote in his favor, when he was saying over the phone, I just want to find 11,780 votes. And more lessons are around robust power of voter tabulation systems. I was reading in the African arguments that uh, the UNPD actually invested uh, 5 million US dollars in a robust power of voter tabulation. And they had uh, uh, polling agents across 99% of polling stations. Also election monitoring, high tech information systems, and above all, an active citizen. This can help to defend the vote and reduce, as I said, rigging that is related to inflation and deflation of numbers. Then the fifth lesson from Zambia is that uh, the youth are not clueless about politics. The status and relationship between youth, politics, and elections was stuck in Zambia. The youth registered, came out to vote in large numbers, and defended the vote, as Neo Simutani was saying. And I think this is a lesson to Africa where almost 60% of the population is under the age of 25. If you look at the Ibrahim Forum report, uh, it, it says that 60% of Africans and especially youth, they think that their governments are doing a very bad or a fairly bad job at addressing the needs of young people. If you check in South Africa, Six out of 10 youth are said to be not formally employed in Mozambique, Malawi, Swaziland, and Zimbabwe. The youth endure precarious livelihoods. So a lesson from Zambia is that youth are critical and have agents that can change uh, the game. And the final lesson, lesson number six, is that Africa needs transformative policies. You know, the incumbent is the economic policies in Zambia were detached from the daily quotidian concerns of the peasantry and working class. The people, the ordinary people, were being told a lot of high modern statistics, but their pockets were empty, their stomachs were empty. And personally, I have been to many parts of Zambia, including Kalumbila in Sulawesi between 2016 and 2021. And I have seen how big mines are destroying the ordinary people's livelihoods with no state protection. The policies favor the elites, massive incentives for mines. You wonder what Zambia is getting out of it. There's patronage, there was corruption in, in, in society. But this is not isolated. As, as we read that uh, foreign investors are actually targeting 10 million hectares of land in Africa, and most governments actually lack a win-win-win solution. I've been to Mokopane in South Africa, Chisumbanje in Zimbabwe, Guruwe in Mozambique, and to Kota Kota and Chikwawa districts in Malawi. And the outcry from the ordinary people is the same. So in the absence of transformative policies, the lesson from Zambia is that citizens can reclaim 
their power. And to me, this is good news for our young democracy in Africa. Uh, thank you, convener. Fantastic. Very well done indeed. I don't want to summarize what you have summarized the discussion for us very well. We'll come back to it at the end. What I want to do now is perhaps to uh, get some uh, contributions from our participants in this uh, exercise. I see many familiar faces, Anur Tsunga, we have see Liz Mudenda, my sister-in-law there, and sister. I see Justina Mkoko, Pisa Muzulu, Lab Mugadenge. I see Bolet Mbeki, Nigel Namutumbu, Prince in London, my old brother Stan Rylander, Valentine Yasin Nara. This year, you guys. Stan from Sweden, you want to say something to us? Uh, yes, do we, raise our, do we raise our hands or we just start to speak? Just or? come in, just speak. Who's, identify yourself. Uh, my name is Valentine Sinemani. Okay, welcome. Um, welcome. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mandaza and the, the, the presenters. I just I missed some, so I came in. We have a power cut in our neighborhood, so I just had to uh, find this very interesting discussion. Um, I find that maybe what we need to do uh, is just a comment I have. The events that have happened in Zambia were, were a breath of fresh air for me personally, and I'm sure a lot of people in Zimbabwe that we wish we had a similar structure. Um, of institutions that are stronger and maybe a peaceful transfer of, of the vote um, that the people would have expressed. I just want to make a contribution that the new president, HH, if he has the right heart, the right heart, because the problem, we can only make contributions from Zimbabwe. And I was thinking this morning, what should happen is Zambia and Zimbabwe they must set up a forum of exchange of ideas because most of the solutions for Zambia are in Zimbabwe. Uh, I think the, the, the experiences that we, we have, we can share in all aspects. And I would think that uh, if the president could set up new structures for collaboration of sharing ideas across SADC, but more specifically from Zimbabwe. So let me just start off with just a precursor briefly. What is Zimbabwe? Zimbabwe is a place where it's a jurisdiction where things are not done properly. That's all. Things are not done properly. And also it's a jurisdiction that is characterized by lack. Lack. Everything in Zimbabwe is the usual Shona words. Uh, apana, Atina, Atizive, Ameno, Ashibumirwe. Uh, so basically in, in, in translation, it's, it's, it's a state where we don't have, it's not allowed, and it doesn't work, we don't know, which then comes in to express itself in long processes, things taking too long to be done. And that creates this severity of, of shortages because of limitation of statutory instruments. It's the heart of the leader. The leader has to change their heart to face the young people and face the future. So if you can continuously monitor the heart of your, of your, of your president, would we'll do well. Um, I do think that Zambians stand the greatest opportunity. We are in a new era, in a new opportunity. And right now, I would suggest that uh, the government of Zambia takes the position that by default, location-wise, we're supposed to go to Zambia. But we're willing to, to give the idea that this goes to Zambia. So let me give an example. Zambia stands to be a, a distribution hub, a logistics hub. If we connect Zambia with the pipeline oil for Angola, uh, and process, Zambia can distribute to Zimbabwe, Malawi, Mozambique, even to DRC and Tanzania and far as Uganda. So there has to be a new redefinition of the starting context of what is Zambia. Zambia is the potential of what Zimbabwe was supposed to be and the time is right because Zambia is lucky. You have a president. We don't have a president. 
You need to have a president and, 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 and people who think and be able to come up with innovation. I'm glad that the new president is, is prioritized entrepreneurship and digital revolution. That's what you can tap into young people. We need to create Zambia to be the possibility of things that happen. One area that I part particularly part uh, participated in Zambia when I was in the Ministry of Transport is when I realized that Zambia does not have its own national airline. So we went into fifth freedom arrangements for everything for Zambia. In about three, four weeks, we have Emirates, we had everybody coming in. What I suggest, one move, one policy today, if the new, guy, the new president can declare Zambia open skies, airlines can come, land, go anywhere because you're in a blessed environment. You don't have a national airline to worry about. So very soon people would want to try to access Zambia with these new dynamics that are coming in. And if you can start to uh, capitalize on your airlines, let there be at least one country in our territory that allows freedom of movement, liberalize, open up, create the infrastructure. If you take advantage of this Kazungula, the fact that you can order something from South Africa and it can go through Botswana and arrive through um, Zambia without dealing with Zimbabwe. What a blessing. You don't have to deal with this nonsense. So you can connect directly to Angola. You can make Zambia the next distribution hub for DRC for everything in any way. So we encourage you Zambia to move in, liberalize, make sure everything is fine and articulate in your area. Thank you very much, Zambia. We wish the best to this new president. Um, and of course, you've got to deal with your Chinese factor, which is something else you've got to deal with. Thanks, Valentine. I've seen three hands there. There's Tony Rila, Tabith Ndoro. Let's have Tony Rila. And Blessing Mataka. Rila first. Tony. I was very struck by what Neo said about the failure of clientelism in Zambia. And that's very interesting that that failed so comprehensively and the youth rejected it. But my, my point is really that what was different in Zimbabwe, in Zimbabwe and uh, Phil raised that, was that the military were not a factor. So Zimbabwe, we have a double factor that has to be dealt with which is the clientelism of the state and the coercion uh, of the state backed by the military. And I'd be interested to see how people think that we can deal with that. Blessing, uh, Tabith is still there? If not, I'll have Blessing Mataka. Blessing. Thank you, Dr. Mandaza. Uh, I don't know if you still remember your previous uh, student from South yes. But, uh, I really, hello. Yeah. I can hear you, Tabith. Carry on. Yes, um, I really enjoyed uh, in almost all the presentations, even the recommendations by the last speaker. Uh, the idea of really build, coming up, um, coming up with strong institutions. In fact, uh, uh, really, I've also learned a lot. I wish in Zimbabwe we could learn uh, from, from the, we could benefit from the recommendations from the speakers. And also, we really need to learn a lot, especially uh, from what happened in, um, in Zambia, that uh, we really need to empower uh, these youth and also uh, the idea of building of strong institutions. Thank you, uh, Madam. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, sir, Tabith. Thank you. Blessing Mataka. Unmute um, yourself. Okay. All right. Okay. I, uh, you know, it's, it's a very intriguing discussion. But the, the, the comparison between Zambia and Zimbabwe is, it's, for me, it's a bit quite off. Because the politics between the two countries, you know, they're, they're different. Yeah, we are talking about strong institutions. That, that is very important. And uh, when you look at Zambia, possibly, and, and Zimbabwe, the major difference is maybe the fact that the institutions in Zambia are not militarized like what you find in in Zimbabwe. So even when we talk about reforms, I don't think there is something fundamentally wrong maybe with the institutions in Zimbabwe, but maybe the fact that there are some 
individuals who are bigger than those institutions, and also that these institutions, they are not accountable maybe to the, you know, to the constitution, but maybe accountable to individuals. That is where the biggest problem is there. So when we talk about reforms, maybe it's not about changing these institutions, but maybe removing individuals from this particular institution. Then one striking issue for me that came from this Zambian election, possibly something similar to Zimbabwe again is, I don't think the issue is about uh, people voting and you know being able to win an election. I think even in Zimbabwe that has been happening. But the difference which I saw here is uh, the ability to defend the vote. People might say, you know, you know, everything was okay and stuff. But there was a lot happening, you know, behind the scenes. There was a, a lot of invisible hands happening behind the scenes. I'll tell you that this outgoing government possibly, you know, behaved in a, in, in a lot of ways more, more like than PF. Okay. So, but the opposition was in a position to defend the, the vote. Yes, of course, external players came in, these are the former presidents and stuff. But the opposition itself was in, on the ground and was in a position to defend the vote for manipulation and things like that. So that is another big lesson that I think we need to learn, the ability to, to defend the vote, not only in Zambia, but in all other African countries. That's why I stop. Well, are, are you Zambian or Zimbabwean or both? Zimbabwean based in Zambia. Yes, but is <laughs> on both sides of the border. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I was going to ask you uh, if you are in Zimbabwe. Uh, that what is it that, um, is, that what is it that that uh, caused the MDC in 2018 and in previous elections not to defend the vote as as the opposition did in Zambia? You want to try and answer that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. <clears throat> There are a lot of issues. The basic issues of having, you know, committed individuals from the polling station, the basic aspect of having strong individuals in, in oppositions who are able to stand against the, you know, the machinations of the regime. That is very fundamental. If those who were following here, there was, you know, I think Honorable Garin Combo, he was on the ground and he was willing to fight and defend the vote such personalities are lacking in the opposition in Zimbabwe. And that is one fundamental aspect I think that we need to work on. We need people who possibly put the interests of the nation, of their party ahead before any other, any other interest. Thanks, Machaga. Thanks, Blessing. Uh, Nigel, okay. Nyamutumbu. Nigel, if you can take us out of the themes that, that, that uh, Blessing Machaga Yes. Yes, so mine is actually uh, a bit of a question to the uh, a panelist uh, insofar as uh, the way forward and, you know, the uh, president-elect Chilema's uh, plan, number one, to deal with corruption. Uh, I was a part of an observer mission uh, there in Lusaka, and the ordinary talk on the ordinary men on the streets, uh, part of the you know, protest vote, as it were, uh, was largely to deal with the you know scourge and and you know high increase of uh, be they cartels, comradeship, uh, particularly around uh, corruption, on whether um, we we are actually going to see. Uh, each lemma not using perhaps a replacement model, but if there are going to be uh, some real safeguards uh, and safety nets uh, on, 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 on dealing with uh, uh, corruption, which uh, is, is certainly on the rise. And also insofar as uh, uh, the entrenchment of the authoritarianism uh, system uh, in, in, in Lusaka, in Zambia, rather, if you look at uh, how the, the Lungu's administration had an appetite to introduce repressive law, the last being um, uh, the cyber security law, which uh, in all intents and purposes was just targeting at criminalizing 
depression, uh, uh, the you know internet shutdowns, uh, both covert and overt uh, means uh, of uh, 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 suppressing uh, citizens. Well, if I want to have a feel from the panelists, see uh, some uh, real you know identification of some of these perpetrators. Uh, are we going to see the vessels? Uh, so far, some of uh, these laws are considered that I was in part answered, uh, and indeed around uh, and so forth that is obtaining in uh, Zambia at the moment. Uh, to be interested to get reflections from panelists in Zambia. Uh, thanks, uh, convener. Thanks, thanks, uh, Nigel. This is my Madrin. Madrin, can you come in? Then Yasin Nara. Madrin? Madrin? Oh, yes. Um, thank you so much, um, uh, Ibo, and thank you, everyone who has presented before me. Uh, and congratulations to the Zambians. Um, I would like to appreciate uh, what the Zambian community did, uh, the idea of the buy-in, not only by the youth, but I've been in touch um, with my friends who are in Zambia. I understand families were going together with their uh, children, uh, the youth uh, and uh, the male and the female, which is a good thing, which we don't see in Zimbabwe in most cases. And also someone spoke about the defending of the votes. That is something that we really need. And in Zimbabwe, we see there's a voter apathy, which we don't see, which we didn't see in Zambia. Uh, and um, my uh, recommendation is what's gonna happen after um, HH comes into power, because um, I feel that the electorate is uh, let down so many times where people are so excited that there's a change of regime, uh, but uh, with time, you find that um, a lot of integrity issues begin to be compromised. And I'm just hoping that we won't see a repeat of what we are seeing in Malawi and um, all that kind of thing. Thank you, Ibo. Thanks, thanks, Madrin. Nara, give your hand up. Nara, Yasin Nara. Yes, Yasin, go on. Yasin. Yasin. Yes, yes, Yasin. Am I clear? That Yasin? Can I'm here, hear? can you hear? Okay, All right. Um, I just wanted to quickly touch on um, the aspect raised, I think, two speakers ago um, about this, uh, by one of the panelists, sorry, about the symbiotic relationship um, between the military here in Zimbabwe and our ruling party. Um, I think that's a critical um, area of difference between um, the two nations. And I think Blessed, um, Blessed mentioned powerful individual. I think that in itself is, is not sufficient because as, as we've seen over the past, you know, five to eight years, we have individuals who stand up and on their own, it's not enough. I think there's need for us to engage um, our citizenry more so that they can help to support um, the vote, even where we don't agree. Um, there's strength in our numbers to say, well, listen, this is the vote that was given and we will support it because this is what is constitutionally correct. So I think that's a key point. It's not just about powerful individuals, but an empowered citizenry who can assist to defend their vote collectively. Thank you, Doc. Thank you very much. I think now I see no more hands. I'll go back to Zamchia to, for his last words, but in particular to to answer to some of the issues he raised, which the discussion has provoked, in particular, the comparison between Zimbabwe and Zambia. 
Um, it's really the men of the speakers here have uh, have reacted to your to your comparisons that you made. You gave a beautiful um, uh, outlay of the the continental situation, but perhaps in your last words you could highlight the comparison between Zambia and Zimbabwe. Professor Zamchia. No, uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. I think uh, uh, those have been very useful uh, discussions. Uh, perhaps before we, we try to talk about the comparative politics, I really uh, hear people elaborating about uh, the need uh, to vote and to defend um, the vote. I think from lesson number four, where I said the, the lesson from Zambia is that, uh, uh, you know, elections rigging as a ceiling, I tried to emphasize uh, those, those points. And I also think that uh, the issue of institutions is very important. The moment you have some people who are bigger than institutions who are not accountable, uh, that automatically means that you have uh, weak institutions and uh, you need uh, to reform those, uh, those institutions. So if we look at uh, Zimbabwe and Zambia, I think that uh, it's uh, difficult uh, to compare if we look at the, the democratic culture in these two countries, how they have progressed uh, since uh, the end of uh, British colonial rule in, in, in both countries. Uh, so the democratic uh, political culture in Zambia, um, it's actually an added advantage. You know that uh, uh, Zambia has experienced, uh, you know, the change in political leaders over time, numerous times. Over time, there was uh, President Kaunda, then we had uh, Chuluba. Then after Chuluba, there was Manawasa. Then there was Banda. I think uh, after Banda, uh, there was uh, Michael Sata. Then after Michael Sata, you had Guy Scott uh, stepping in uh, temporarily. After that, you had Edgar Lungu. And after Edgar Lungu, uh, you had, um, you now have. Uh, HH, the new president. And I think that uh, that culture is very, very important. And uh, Zimbabwe should also start uh, building on that, uh, on that culture and make sure that, uh, you know, leaders come and go. Leaders cannot be there uh, forever. Uh, even political parties, that's when they begin to try and, uh, you know, grow bigger than institutions. So that's one, the issue of uh, political culture. Uh, then the second aspect I try to make reference to it is the, the militarization of the state and society in Zimbabwe. Uh, if you compare with Zambia, there's quite a huge vast difference. So I see the excitement on social media streets uh, and so forth that uh, uh, a Zambia can happen in Zimbabwe, can it happen? The answer is yes, if the citizen will take charge. Uh, but before that, uh, I don't think this change in Zambia uh, should actually result in progressive forces in Zimbabwe setting aside uh, certain propositions that they had about curing the military coup in Zimbabwe, because most of these things will work once you cure the military coup, as long as you still have a military state, uh, it's 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 going to be it's going to be to be difficult. And uh, yeah, having having said that, um, we, we can debate about the nitty gritties what exactly was done in Zambia in terms of the practicalities, but also the state of the political parties is also something that needs to be considered. I think the opposition in Zambia was actually more organized and uh, uh, the leadership there uh, was really up to it. And, uh, you know, opposition political parties in Zimbabwe, they still need uh, to learn a lot. Uh, they still need uh, to be united and also to be, to be actually, uh, you know, much stronger uh, than what uh, 
they are at uh, at the moment. But I wouldn't want to go back into my presentation, but I think I've tried to give uh, those two, six overall lessons, which I think also uh, apply to, uh, to, to Zimbabwe. So Zimbabwe must think of a moment, a transitional moment, what would tr trigger that transitional moment uh, first and for, foremost uh, from this military rule? Is it going to be mediation, an international conference, a transitional authority of some sort? Zimbabwe should never lose sight of that. Because as I was saying, as went the military, uh, so went uh, uh, the transition. Uh, but that shouldn't take away the citizens' his agents. Uh, let me just uh, um, conclude by saying that uh, uh, President H.H. H. of Zambia uh, campaigned on the philosophy of change and on the philosophy of democratization. Uh, a few months ago, we also heard the President Lazarus Chakwera from Malawi who campaigned on the philosophy of change and on the philosophy of democratization. And uh, I just received news that he is now the SADC chairperson, the incoming SADC chairperson until August 2022. And uh, I think uh, my last appeal to President HH is that uh, he must carry that uh, philosophy uh, to the SADC spaces. I know how difficult it is and how SADAC operates, but I think it's important to be able to go and add his voice in the SADAC spaces. So far, uh, President Chakwera has been disappointingly uh, uh, quiet, given the state of, of, of democracy in the region that is in the intensive care unit. Uh, on that note, thank you, uh, Convina. Thanks, uh, thanks, uh, Professor Zamchia. This is a fantastic contribution by you, as usual. We thank you. And I move now to uh, my next speaker is uh, Shpenzi. Are you still there, Shpenzi? Sorry, Shpenzi. Your last words, please. If you're still there. McDonald? I'm still here. I'm here, I'm okay. here. Yeah, just sum up a minute I'm or two, here. please. Just sum up. Thank you so much. Um, I think my last word is um, for the region to, to learn something uh, from what has happened to Zambia and how to hold elections in the COVID and the challenges of that. Uh, and further, we hope that um, the new president uh, will be um, a shining example of how to defend freedoms, rights of citizens in the region and try to talk to his colleagues uh, privately and publicly uh, to denounce the violation of human rights since he has gone through uh, the same path where he was subjected, oppressed, suppressed uh, because of his um, right to associate, right to express and right to movement. So I hope that uh, he's going to, to be more practical and be able to, uh, to stand and defend the rights of citizens in the region. Thank you. Zikomo Kambiri, Zikomo. Owen, Sichone, your last words of wisdom. Thank you, Ibo. Uh, as I said, uh, as I said earlier, I think this uh, transition is more similar to 1991 than to 2011. Uh, there is a sense of a, a new broom and also a, a new beginning. However, if the new president is going to lecture to his colleagues in Sadiq, uh, Comesa, AU, like President Chiluba did, then he will come to the same end, uh, which is to be isolated and, uh, and weakened. Uh, also, the new broom doesn't sweep uh, cleaner. It might not even sweep because 
uh, there is a, what we might call corruption from below. And this involves uh, the crossing of the, the flow so that uh, losing parties somehow end up, end up being represented in the new system or in the new administration rather. And I remember a story about uh, President Chiruba that uh, after his first meeting with the secretary to the cabinet, which ended in the wee hours of the morning, when they left the office, there was a long queue of people waiting to see the new president and to be included in the cabinet and the diplomatic corps and so on and so forth. So this happens uh, all the time. And even if one enters office uh, with a good heart, as, as was mentioned, uh, they really need to be very strong and to start losing some of their friends in order to stick to their original program. And the begging for jobs is relentless. When Michael Sata became president before he moved to State House, he was in his own ho uh, house in uh, Rhodes Park, yes, named after the man. Uh, and uh, every Sunday, people were going to St. Ignatius Church, where he worshipped from, again, queuing up after the service and uh, petitioning him. There's also the corruption of uh, the average citizen who also does their own uh, tax, their own tax evasion, and uh, sometimes degenerating into lawlessness of uh, all kinds, uh, like just disrespecting traffic uh, regulations, driving cars without number plates, and uh, as has already been mentioned, the the cadres, the party cadres who are some of the culprits, just render it impossible for the police to act. So more than the army, I think the police has uh, been uh, destabilized. They have lost their self-confidence and they are always looking over their shoulders. Should I act or should I not? Even when they act, they might receive a telephone call from uh, some official or some official's relative, uh, which reverses their activity. Institutions like the Anti-Corruption Commission, we can't even talk about. They don't act. Uh, so the army is protected from that kind of uh, uh, destabilization and deprofessionalization. And talking about the militaries in the two countries, uh, from the little contact I've had with them, uh, training um, in peacekeeping at the staff colleges, they are very similar. They think alike as professionals, and indeed they do train together. But the difference is uh, the Zimbabwean army or the Zimbabwean military has zapped ZANU-PF as its political wing. <laughs> or uh, to put it differently, uh, <laughs> the, the army, the army, is the military wing of Zanu PF, and none of the political parties have a military wing. Although there has been a move uh, towards uh, arming their so-called party cadres, so we we have been on, on dangerous ground. And finally, on defending the. Defending the vote. If the vote is a 50 50 affair, as we had in 2015, uh, 2015 and 2016, it's very difficult to prevail because you are evenly matched. And what you have is a dangerous polarization, which is the reason why our Commission of Inquiry was set up. But when you have a clean sweep like uh, has happened now, it's much easier. To even for the losers to acknowledge that, well, we've been given quite a hiding and we won't be able to, to mobilize the support to prevail over the, the, the opposition. So if you have a 50-50 a divide with a very narrow margin in our first uh, past the post system, it's uh, the incumbent who has an advantage. 
Okay, I think I'll end there. Oh, and that's fantastic. Thanks very much, Owen. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you. Very much. We move to our last, our first but last speaker now. Um, uh, Neo Simutanyu, and I want to also acknowledge his role in organizing this panel. It was largely his work for which we are most, most uh, grateful. And is so, Neo, your last words. Thank you very much. I would like to um, thank Ilan, Ilan for that very um, insightful presentation and the, the points that were raised, which are very, very relevant to the Zambian context. <clears throat> Let me talk about the defending of the vote. Um, I was one of the monitors and uh, worked with the um, <clears throat> the GEARS initiative, who had uh, uh, a network uh, across all constituencies of the country. Um, I think it's important when people have a perception that the election may be stolen. Because the 2016 election was not, 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 really free and, not, not free and not fair, but also it was clearly, it clearly smelled of manipulation. But the results, even the, even the contestation of the result, it was not actually reach fruition because the constitutional court was weaponized. So it was not possible even for those losers to actually go there. So this time around, um, the, the electorate, especially the young ones, felt that they had to defend the vote. And I think the opposition made it a point that where they were pretty absent, the last time they, they took it for granted that there was discontent and people vote for them and so forth, but they, they didn't take, uh, they didn't make, take steps to ensure that they had people on the ground, sufficient people on the ground to prevent manipulation. So this time around, that is what happened. And I think uh, someone mentioned there was a big investment in ensuring that there was a presence of party agents across the country. So all the claims that were made, for example, by uh, by, by, by Eddie Kalungu that the uh, election was unfair, unfair. You know, they, they, they just be dismissed. Because uh, if it was any, if anything, it was actually uh, his party which created conditions for unfairness and fairness of the election. So people made sure that actually uh, that was not going to happen. So I think that is really important and, uh, and um, I, I am, I'm grateful to that, that, that comment. Um, let me also t- uh, touch on the point um, about uh, the comparison between Zambia and Zimbabwe. Uh, we have always been praised as Zambia that we have a very good democratic system. Uh, yes, our institutions may be, may be strong, but they are politicized. Uh, to the extent that even the anti-corruption commission cannot function. Because when we have a situation where ministers named in corruption scandals can hold their jobs. They can actually move from their offices to go and appear in court. They know that there's a problem. When the president cannot fire people who are named in, in corruption scandals, then there's a problem. So if there's anything that uh, uh, president, incoming president Haka uh, Indechilema can do is to be resolute, to, be, to ensure that if someone is named in a scandal, as he was mentioning the other day, yesterday, that uh, he will let the institutions be professional. If they is able to give them a free hand to do their job professionally, it will be possible to attack, to, 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 uh, to, to tackle corruption. It will be possible. Uh, because then the law will just take, take its course. Of course, there are people who are debating whether or not uh, the, the incumbent should be prosecuted and so forth. And of course, he, he, he kept clear of that. But what he mentioned was that he will ensure that institutions do their job. But what normally, what will happen, and I'd like to agree with Owen, is that uh, if he, he appoints his friends, if he appoints the people that he has been with all along, he will be weakened because he'll be unable to discipline them. So if this is a time for some of these people, uh, we know something about them. So he has to be sure that he actually gets people who are independent, who are professional, and who he can actually dispense with without any repercussions. Uh, that is, I think, the challenge. But he also faces another challenge, 
which is that, uh, you know, uh, he, ha he has these people who worked with him in the alliance and, and he has to give them jobs. So there will be a problem. No, the, this queuing for jobs is not only UPND people, but there are also these so-called alliance partners. They also want to be given jobs. In the end, it will uh, dilute, uh, you know, what he really wants to do because he'll find himself with baggage as most of these people uh, all want jobs and nothing else. And then are the ones who may not actually have the, uh, the vision of, of UPND because they come from different parties. You know, I, I really don't know how you deal with it, how you do with Mutati, how you deal with the NS Mwansa uh, and these other people, you know, because they, they will be competing for positions with UPND people who have been around in the UPND from the beginning of time. So really, uh, those are the things which weaken leaders. Those are things which make it difficult for them to be professional, to follow their, their, what, what they really want to do. Let me stop there and, and simply uh, conclude by saying, we hope that uh, an incoming president, Akainde, will, will actually follow through uh, you know, what he used to do when he was a manager, that he will look for caliber of people who are, who are able to deliver that you are professional, and this thing called tribalism is not going to be there, no, the type of considerations. Because already it has been shown that actually it's, it's, it is actually, it, it, it's not there. Because the people who voted for him are from across the country. And, and I, I hope that his promise that his first cabinet will reflect Zambians. I hope he actually uh, is able to implement that. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, uh, thanks, Neil. Thanks very much for that summary. A more a message to the new president than to <laughs> to the than to the to the discussion here. Uh, <laughs> that note, I think, uh, was, as I said earlier in the, in the beginning of this program, we have witnessed transitions in Zambia, and I remember the MMD one in particular. And I want to say to ourselves, those who intellectuals, academicians, we have been involved in the state. I was one of the first in, in our group at Independence. Uh, one of the most important things is that we do not, as academicians, we don't become sucked into the pathologies of the state. And I know some of us in Zambia, some of our group, may end up in cabinet as advisors, as functionaries, as technocrats. Please keep the flag high. The principles which are so central to, 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 to intellectual life to academia, Owen, is to keep our souls alive. And the principles for which we have been fighting uh, as academicians, but also as activists, so that we bring to bear on the state the importance of the reform of the state. Secondly, is just to acknowledge the very important discussion we had today and the beautiful summary that uh, uh, plans I'm sure has provided for us, the six lessons. They need to break with the past to procedural certainties with, uh, with out, outcomes which are uncertain. Strong institutions against a strong man. Uh, the personal element, and this is very important for us in Zimbabwe, the extent to which we can uh, mobilize regional and international support towards some kind of international course in Zimbabwe. I don't think that it's possible in Zimbabwe to have the kind of election process that we have seen in Zambia. We're just less than 24 months away from elections and it's difficult to imagine that we can go through the same process. Not to mention that our militarized political system will have drawn some lessons of a negative kind of how to counter what happened in Zambia. So we, we, if there are elections in 2023, they are likely to be very acrimonious. And one would argue that maybe you're still talking about some kind of mediation towards a kind of some uh, transition authority because the elections won't help and it's too late. We don't have the kind of opposition movement as organized as that we saw in Zambia, which can defend its, its vote, which can set up, as we saw, 
polling agents across the country, every polling station at polling agents, which can invest in a parallel voting tabulation system. And we've seen that since 2008, the opposition movement has failed to do even the menu in that regard. And yes, I agree with uh, Zamchia, election rigging has a limit. But in a highly militarized situation, as we saw in 2018, even the best of efforts, we had a fantastic turnout in 2018. In 2013 as well, in 2008, these efforts were cynically dismissed by a militarized Yes, we have a fair youth, but remember in Zimbabwe, it's a disorganized youth system. Unlike Zambia, which was able to mobilize its youth, ours is very fragmented. It is very divided. And above all, we have 75% of our professional and skilled people outside the country. Yes, the major challenge is transformative policies. These remain the challenge. And indeed, as we have heard from everyone here, is the major challenge facing the new government in Zambia, just how to answer the burning questions about which the election was fought and on the basis of which the outgoing government lost. And I'm no doubt that when we meet again, five years hence, the same issues will be raised. We really hope that our colleagues in Zambia will have learned from the past, learned from also from the failures in the neighboring countries and learn to get citizens, as Zamshia said, to reclaim the, the platform for change. There are very serious challenges ahead of us. And lastly, just to thank our Zambian colleagues and and to to load the fact that we are reuniting as SAPES 34 years since our inception and to meet persons who have been part and parcel of the long journey, Simtani himself and Owen Sichoni. It's been fantastic. Thank you. And thank you again, uh, Neo Samutanya, for putting this together. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and, and good night. Thank you, ciao. Thank you.